defensive mode, how, uh, why don't we use more of an attack posture, in other words, attacking somebody, how really do you attack? And this is actually an extremely philosophical point, but it's a very easy to answer, but the answer is difficult to understand. There is no first attack in karate. It does not exist. Nothing. So unless you're within the salt range of the person, the fight doesn't start. So there's what you call a closure theory in fighting. And that's that you move in and you close. So the system's like this, again, as I say. You have a ship. You move it around. The ship tries to position itself within, a, within range. When it's in range, the problem is keeping the guns here, trained all the time, so when that accidentally you come within range, the guns fire boom. That's the principle of the technique. The, there's several things that have to be understood. There's reasons that when you can't get in close, and there's reasons why you can't keep the guns aimed, and there's reasons why the guns can't shoot at a moment's notice. There's reasons for that. The first reason is a disconnection of the body. When I'm moving in, the hands are out here, the hands are back here, you don't have control of your hands. So anything that provides absolute control of the hands enables the position of the weapons. The second thing is that if the feet and ankles aren't correct, you can't even, you depend on the other person to come to you. So the leg, knee, and hip actions and the waist actions allow you to attack people. For example, I'm standing here, he's over here <coughs> in this case, and, uh, uh, and uh, he's just standing right here right here, and if I'm attacking, going to attack him, and I attack him hard, and when do you feel uncomfortable? If he's a really good karate guy, he has to move to punch me. But on the other hand, if he's a really good karate guy, he can punch me without moving, can't he? Because he has a full area of weapons here available to him, and if he has to use this fist, then he has to turn the face. If he's going to use his hand in this kind of action, then he does not. In other words, at this point, if he can poke me in the eye, it doesn't. So a lot of the position, thank you, of the body in chasing somebody down depends upon the flexibility of your waist and the ability of your hips to move. So in chasing somebody down, without a doubt, those people are most flexible and have more control of their knee hip connections and their feet uh, can be sure. Like I used to chase people down, and uh, I never you punched anybody that I can remember really well. But I can guarantee you that you, no matter how good your skill was, would not escape my sidekick. Because no matter where you were, my kick would find its way to your face, and that was it. You were every, I kicked everybody in the head constantly, and nobody could avoid it. Even the very best fighters couldn't avoid it. Because I could start to say, you could, I could, be, I could be chasing you, and you'd be running this way. My sidekick would actually turn around about 360 degrees and land on your head. And you couldn't avoid it. It's like, a, it's like I have a broom, and I stick you with a broom, and I'm chasing you. And whenever you move, the point of the boom wraps around and gets you. That's that kind of technique. So there's a certain kind of flexibility, <laughs> hips and waist that are necessary, good morning, Jen, to, to indicate this complete kind of action. So first place, the ability to close is of critical value. The ability to keep the, to, uh, to twist the waist and move the waist so that the weapons are in position when, when you're moving, the other person turns the weapons or can turn with it. Like the new modern tanks, you know, the gun swings this way. Think what happened if a tank, they had to turn the whole tank to shoot the gun. The, the, the gun, the turret moves and the tank is still going. See, it's that kind of thing. You have to have that. And then thirdly, the reflexive coordination between the body position and the weapon has to be there. And the reflexive coordination is destroyed by tension of maintaining hands and by tension of the pull here. This destroys that. So, like the climb you form is an exercise of mobility. It's an exercise in, in movement of the body. It's an exercise of, of the trigger response of the, of the weapons to the body mobility. Now, all that being said, we have the quick drills of punching. And we have the ultimate drill for sparring, which you do quite often, don't you? Don't you? What is the best drill for sparring? Yes. <coughs> sparring. <laughs> sparring. Of course. So sparring can't be taught any way but sparring. And the problems that present themselves as sparring are, are, are just a pretty simple problem. So you have to resolve a certain group of problems at the base level. 
And then you'd have to do some mat kicking with the baseball <coughs> over the of the kicks. And then it was in the combination of two breeds of fighting out. As far as street techniques go, the uh, sparring uh, uh, doesn't function. It doesn't, it's just, uh, uh, useless for street techniques. I'm like, come on, it's another secret. It's, 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 it's useless for fighting. So in that sense, the form is designed to do certain things, not so, uh, uh, and it includes, but there's a serious, serious, serious fighting techniques, killing techniques. But for the kumite generally, there's no way to train for kumite except kumite. You could train all the facets of kumite, such as kicking the mass, and such as epon, where uh, the back and forth, and for the drills that we have, the combination, you can put all the facets, but for uh, you cannot assemble them unless you assemble them. The facets of, uh, of competition sparring cannot be assembled unless they're practiced in the assembled state. My opinion. Is it important to do that? If you're an ordinary citizen, ordinary life is not important. It's not just less than important because actually fighting does not consist of chasing, running down the street after so many people should have. That's what it consists of. You do that, you go to jail right off the first half. That's it. Nobody, nobody can sustain that. On the other hand, if you're a solder or somebody is solving somebody, come up and really wipe them out. That's another animal. So there's two entirely different things. Does that pretty much answer your question? Does <coughs> if it doesn't, it keep on. Out. Um. I don't know that I care about the sparring part of it, but it's you're someone drawing in is considered an attack. Somebody so what? You someone someone um, enclosing on your space is considered an attack. No, that's not considered an attack. It's somebody where the space closes. Not when somebody closes or you close or anything. When the space closes, the attack is there. When the close space closes, it could be the or you. It's called a closure. Closure. When the spaces are close, then the attack is there. If you're doing karate, and it can be fed upon a motive or something, when the space closes, the attack is present. And the cat can't be present until the space closes. So an attack is a defense. A defense is an attack. Offense and attack are two words that really have no absolute meaning. So you don't have this have you defend your attack, and they don't really have an absolute meaning at all. They're actually both interwoven. And they're, they're interwoven with a lot of social positioning and a lot of other things. But the uh, uh, you know, that, that's a really good question you're asking. It's excellent, but you have to see it and, and from the perspective of I've had at least 10,000 fights. And I probably, I don't think it, in, in my prime, I don't think hardly anybody in this class could match me and that includes the best champions here. I was awfully arrogant. I don't think anybody beat me. I went two years and nobody even tested my uniform. I put about 50 people in the hospital during that time, some of the very best fighters. And so the guys that knew me from a long time were scared to death to fight with me for a long time ago. And so I, I you know, that, uh, uh, I always, uh, I didn't have any rubber trouble chasing people down. And when I ran the roof, I, mean, I did chase people down. I chased them around the house and up over the roof and down the ladders and finally caught them. You know? <laughs> One guy had my truck and I got behind him, a big, big heavy guy, just came out of jail and he had his FU on his shoulder. And I was in a truck and took off my, my van and he was going down the street about 80 miles an hour and went through the top light. So I chased him all the way across the Akron. Finally caught him in my front yard and he pulled in to go home and I got him and I pulverized him. Really me, fired him on the spot and beat the shit out of it, you know? But that was back a long time ago. So I mean, the idea of chasing, see, when that, the closure is the important point. And your point is really valid because when the closure occurs, what can you do? Now, that's one thing. And the second point is how do you force a closure? How do you force the closure? And when the closure comes, if you kick, or should you kick when the guy's coming in on the closure, or you should kick when he's exiting the closure? My opinion always was that you can't side kick when he's coming in and do other kind of kicks on the exit. I never liked to kick on the closure. I always liked the guy to be rolling out or trying to get away from him, and then I kick him really hard. <laughs> See, but when a guy was coming in, either directly kicked him or smacking her, except actually even hitting with this or this when I'm coming in, but I never like to kick on the entrance. If you're talking about sparring, <coughs> see, I never kicked on the entrance. And the one of the mistakes I think is that unless there's a direct boom like that, to kick on the entrance of fighting is a big mistake. You hit on the entrance and kick on the exit. Would you agree? That's exactly the exactly the case. That's the who would mind a really great fighter here to disagree about that. See, that's the thing, because the exit is when, they, when, they, when the guards are generally down. 
know, when the guys roll out, uh, they roll out at that time where you guys have right high roundups. So that's the ideal time to whack them or, or get them. That's when the balance is retreating, and, uh, and, the, ba and the retreating balance is easy. So they, it's the case of a closure. And I've written a lot about that. I, I established what they call the law of random closures. And we put that up. We deal a lot with it in tactical fighting. And we deal with that a lot. But in action in this form, what we're doing is corrective measures so that you can, as yourself, uh, present yourself as a complete body that's capable of doing anything, either moving or whatever. And there's so many restrictions to the movement. For example, if we were going to uh, here, uh, <laughs> dealing with that, and this is sort of my topic for the day, so, so I am. Uh, I'm happy to have you bring that up because that's I was going to do it anyway, and that's what I've been making notes of before you asked me, so you're right in line with what I was thinking about here. Okay. So in, in, in a closure situation or a fighting situation, what do you consider the primary? Well, let's look, we'll have 10 on everything today. Right, so this is what we're going to teach now. And we have a 10 to 10 thing. What do you consider the primary? We use from the aspect of fighting. Okay? What do you consider the number one uh, error on closures? Yes. The closure means when you come together, we'll say when there's a possibility of attack. We know we create the possibility of attack, utilize the possibility of attack, attack, destroy the possibility for an attack. Isn't that true? We either incite the attack, the, uh, null the attack, create the attack ourselves, or let the other guy create it. That's not much else you can do. Isn't that true? No. Maybe you say the other guy can null it, too, we have five. <coughs> Bob, sure. And Richter's a sure over here. There's a sure over there and one over here. So if you were going to, uh, uh, what do you consider the number one error in the fighter as far as closures go? What's the number one uh, uh, problem that the people in creating the closure? Number one, body snag, if you will. I'll give you a, I, I'll give you a body snag to show you what I'm talking about. The guy's legs in the cast. That, that doesn't work too well, right? <laughs> or, or your hips in the cast, because some people have anyway. Yes? Flinch in the eye. What? Flinch of the eye. What? The flinch of the eyes. Yeah, flinch it. Driving rigs in the wrong place. <laughs> That's what you're saying. Same thing. Yeah, same thing. <clears throat> the wrong foot movement for the uh, range or the distance. Okay. Uh, wrong. Uh, wrong. Causing the over the skin. Too much step back. And uh, this is more. Uh, uh, 
more important than you think because actually you step forward in, in two methods. You either step forward this way, this way, or else you step forward this way, this way. And there are two actually different ways to step forward, and both of them are treated differently. <coughs> For example, if you're going to do a step by back side kick, you do this way, if you don't go a punch, generally you go this way. So there's two different things. You're involved in a punch step, and all of a sudden a kick is necessary. You're involved in a kick step, and a punch is necessary. That would be a, exactly what you're talking about. Okay, timing. Okay, which, which really means not recognizing uh, your position.
And in this induced movement, we intend to see that these various elements come forward. I want to see in random action that these elements can be assembled by you. If they can't go back, we'll go back and start working on compartmentalizing this again. <clears throat> so you compartmentalize things and then you're assembled. It's like when he's putting teeth together. He has one tooth and two tooth and fix it together. And when he's all done, it has to form with a mouth. Is that not correct? Yes, sir. And that's the circumstance. So if these are not dry runs, there's no other way to assemble these except in kata. Otherwise, you're going to be spending day after day after day after day developing these little individual things and putting them back together in the Kwong Kong. You have a three and a half minute exercise which is done twice a, twice a day for the rest of your life. We'll put these things in place or you can ignore them, taking them down the business and doing whatever else it is you want to do with martial arts. Right? Plus you should have the really opportunity of uh, poking somebody's eyes out or ripping out their throat or are doing them really seriously if you need to feel the need to do it. But those have to be put in a social context. And it's just not uh, proper in our society to uh, whine people. And we do have that problem, you know, that, uh, like a guy uh, back in Chicago shot all the nurses. If one of the nurses would put his eyes out, uh, then uh, he would have shot all the nurses. But if she put his eyes out before he shot the nurses, then they put, him in jail, put her in jail for uh, assault. So it's the same problem when a woman faces when uh, she has an ice pick and she's about to be raped. If she sticks the guy before he did anything, she's guilty, and if she waits until he raped her, if she sticks him, she's already done. So there's a choice that's very, very difficult. It's a social choice. Would you not agree? Does that answer your question a little better? And I came to it in an interesting way, didn't I? <laughs> you knew I was going to do that, right? So you did. Okay, now we're going. I said we're going to go to the ten today, so that's what we're going to do. Okay, so we're six, seven, eight, seven, eight, nine, ten. And my writing on the board is uh, bondable, actually. I write in an adversarial fashion. Uh, part of the test is deciphering what I did. <laughs> that's like Pat's test, a wonderful test, but to, to, to decipher what he means is the uh, part of the test. <laughs> Is, is true. Uh, so who writes well on the board? Who's the board writer? Who writes most on the board? So <laughs> you're chosen. You're the board writer. Okay. I can write actually. Now, 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 this is good and bad, okay? Well, let's just do this way. And this is, this is next step. Uh, you know what I'll say? So we'll do this a cappella, right? Right? Which means what? That means without the orchestra. Obviously. Is sir? Yes, sir. Okay, now, this is the good thing. Let's name the first and most important good point in the Kwan Kong. What's the most important point in the doing the Kwan Ten best habits of the Kwan Kong. What? Relaxation. Relaxation. Boy, I thought we'd get that one. Now, these should be memorized, and we can sort these out. I didn't do this yet, and so I'm doing it with you here. The second most important point in the Kwan Kong would be what? Naturalness. Naturalness, okay. Now I've cleared. You have to be reasonable. And this is a word that's used really a lot, and this one here may not mean much to you. <clears throat> this is the word that's used in the Orient as far regarding technique. It's reasonable or not reasonable. That is the number one word, and all the great karate masters use the word reasonable. You're doing it without reason means it's unreasonable. Reasonable means it's doing it with a purpose that has a sound purpose. So reasonable doesn't mean it's okay. It means you did it with a, a good purpose in mind, and the purpose is one you can reason about. So reasonableness is really, really important. It's a major, major word. And when you find any cottage, uh, even the great master said it's just unreasonable. And that dismisses out of hand. Okay, now we're number four. Okay, that's correct. Balance. <laughs> Now remember, the 
these aren't ordered, these are ten of these. And you understand, we get all these ten, we write twenty of these, and then you can only keep nineteen, and you can only keep eighteen, that's how we prioritize them, right? We start here, and we say we have all ten, and we can only keep nine, which one are you going to get rid of? The one you get rid of is number ten. Number nine, we can only keep eight, which one you get rid of, that's number nine. That's where we prioritize them, right? Everybody understand that? Right. Michael, explain it to me. Well, you have 10 facets you want to sort them by the most important. So you figure out which is the least important of the 10. That becomes number 10. Which one do you get rid of? Which one you can get rid of? And then you go back to 9, to 8, to 7, and do that each time. Yeah, which one do you get rid of? The one you discard is the one that's down there, right? right? But you can't sort them by value because it doesn't work that way. The mind doesn't work that way, yeah. Um, I was going to say from the five charting course. Like I won't buy that because I'm not sure what force like means and I'm not sure what thrive means that it works on clear, you can refine it. But I do agree with you, that'd be more refined. Waste movement. What? Waste movement. Uh-huh. Waste movement. <laughs> this is succinctness is actually what you mean. You mean having movements uh, uh, yeah, right. Congruity. What? Congruity. Who said that? Uh, yeah, congruity is exactly it, but define it more, because then it wasn't so many meanings. Yeah, it's harmony and naturalness, which takes harmony and action to one. Can we use the word circularity? Okay, I'll do the same. I'll put the last two. Uh, no. Undo. I say, we don't want to put no in here. These are good things to do. Fluid and agitation. I won't put the waste movement. Yeah. 
dynamics and quality of force. What? Dynamics and quality of force. Okay. That's the dynamics. You've got the temple beaten axe at a time. Damage. <coughs> spatial dimension. Balance. Somewhere you probably have spatial dimension. No, these are the same thing up here. Because this balance and technique is the main same thing. That's the same thing. We can knock out balance technique to dynamics, uh, good dynamics, okay? Let's just put good dynamics here. And we'll just place that. Okay. Okay, now whatever, say uh, 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 harmonious action. We'll just take this out and put harmonious, harmonious. Uh, uh, force through this thing, uh, through harm, okay? <coughs> okay. What else, Pat? Well, I use the space, the spatial uh, dimensions. Well, well, the spatial dimension is the, uh, is the uh, uh, have spatial I, I, well? This is actually spatial dimension here. This is the, the agile foot movement. This is actually you were talking about it. it is your movement uh, movement uh, movements? Uh, boy, this is locomotor and actual movements is what we're talking about. Locomotor, local <coughs> motor agility. I always type and I type and I always have to reflect on that. Okay, look at more of Jody. Yes? The fact that we're moving in every direction, applying <coughs> technique in every... Well, that, that's pretty much look more of Jody. Okay, Jody. <coughs> okay, fluidity and circularity and waist movements and hand formation and good uh, dynamics and reasonableness and, and the naturalness. Of course, these two can be combined, actually. But not, they're not really. <coughs> these, these two are probably the same thing. Okay, now let's talk about the 10 worst habits. The 10 things that we're going to, these are with the desirables, these are the <coughs> bad. Name the worst thing you can possibly do in the forum. Yes? Incorrect breathing. Okay. And we're referring to pattern here from Hill Hill Foot and Costco. That's, in, that's also included in that. Intercostal root breathing and, and uh, this one. Okay. Extreme rigidity. Fancy. What? Extreme rigidity. <clears throat> okay, let's just make it real exact. Say stiff waist. What's that? It's too much snap. What? Too much snap. Zap? Snap. Snap. No, we just say uh, that, that's true, but we'll conclude that under rocking up here. Constant speed. What? Constant speed is compared to variable speed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, what we could say that. No dynamic. What is it called? Monotone. Monotone What is your, there's no dynamics. We could change the word, but that's what it means. Constant speed, constant drawing on, you know. The constant does not drawing on, it does not drawing on. No dynamics. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'll skip another real. 
horrible error. A horrible error. Uh, 
attempt at a power by the locking. Of course, that's terrible for fighting. There's a lot of people do that. Stiff waist doesn't work. Uh, uh, monotone fighting uh, it, it enables the, uh, you can't set anything up with monotone fighting. Uh, Pansi Hara, that really doesn't work either. That's not too much. We do too much of this, by the way. There's way too much of this. Instead of, uh, we're bouncing like this. Instead of bouncing, we set things up. We're bouncing for the sake of bouncing. And boy, that's no good. And we're just gone to an extreme. This has to stop. Bad weapon formation. Uh, this stuff is uh, bulking and agitation. I'm not sure that this is uh, so bad for uh, fighting. And uh, bad weight distribution is, and uh, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not sure this could put maybe the beans are, maybe these two are, don't apply so much to uh, sparring. Right? I'd say one thing, I've replaced this with dull eyes, and sharp eyes. Sparring, you have that experience. Lack of experience is definitely flawed sparring. It's just simple as if you don't spike me. Don't believe it, don't think you can, you can. That's all there's to it. And not that it's important to fight. See, I'm not arguing about the important. A lot of people go through their lives and probably never fight, but they're willing to kill you if they want to, because I know guys are tough and guys who like to fight. They're not always the same type of thing, you know. But you really have to realize that. So these are essentially uh, the things you should be looking for to do the kata. Now, as an all kata, what you really do is list the good and bad, and then you ask, when you say you have a bunch of masters, I mean, which one of these? Am I doing the most? You come up with a printed list and say, well, you circle the one I do the worst. And the guy says, well, this is the one. So you proceed to get rid of that one as much as you can. Then you come up and give the list again and say, which of these nine am I doing badly? And the guy says, these, most. And then you get rid of that one. And you keep getting reducing it until the list reduces down to two or three and you're kind of champ. To try to do the kind of better without understanding what better means is it doesn't work. See, and again, in this form, there is no better. That's why this is really difficult here, because there's no better, because we're dealing not with specifics, but with principles. They're not unique to this form, but in a sense that your group, they're unique. Now, there's not one Heon form, or one other form that requires all these things. Not one. <coughs> that I don't. You see, so that's an example, what I consider an extremely important uh, function. Now, before we go from this, and I'm going to go from this, I'm going to stay on this all day, because I do, I'm not going to go over the lecture completely either, but I'm going to go over some, uh, 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 a few things we did, and then I want to go over who we are. I'll do that later after lunch. I'll go over our historical background. But before uh, morning, I don't want to spend all morning here talking. Now I want to get to doing some things. And we've been talking a long time. We've got a few questions for a few minutes on this. Okay. Now, what we're doing here is uh, Sherry suggested this morning that uh, she needed, she'd like to see the connection between the between the form itself and app and uh, random application, which is a random application which is being fighting. And fighting is of three kinds. In my or two kinds, we can say in my opinion. One is where the guy got your wallet and you want to get it back. And one when you have your wallet and the guy wants to get it. And fighting and fighting takes two places. When neither of you have a point, neither one wants a point, when you're ahead of the guy and he wants to get the point back, when you're behind the guy and you want to get the point, he, you want to get the point up. Okay? So it depends. That again is a circumstance. You know when you're tied, when you're behind, and when you're forward. So you have the same balance that one, two, three finds itself all the time in, in the competitive structure. And it finds it here. A guy whacks you in the nose and you have to figure out how to whack him back, see? Or you whack him and he wants to whack you and you don't want him to do it. <laughs> so there's many of these examples we go back and forth under just the same. And so this, this presents itself quite, quite readily. And this is a good background. I'll perhaps formally do this and refine that. And I'll never remember this, of course. I'll have to redo it. But it'll be, when my, my redoing it, it'll be almost similar. And just like I forgot, they, we, a long time ago, we had all the people meet in, in Oregon and we wrote the 10 worst points of the... Uh, of the Sto uh, Sanchicata and the 10 plus points. And I forgot what they were. I forgot. So Jim asked me, so I made him up a list and sent it to him. And then I found a real list. And the real list was the same as the list I made up. Exactly. And I said, well, you know this. You remembered. I didn't remember. I just looked at it from the same point of view. I don't have to remember how many topics you have to write. Look, I walk out and count them. And it says, how many have? I don't have to remember. Go out and count them yet. <laughs> you know, that's what, 
So that's the kind of thing, and that's the kind of insight that means uh, an insight that you got to know what, where to look and what to count it. There's a discrimination. So you got to count the red ones and the blue ones. I got to be able, I can't be color blind. I have to be able to see which is red and which one is blue, but I can tell you which one by counting. <coughs> so the same thing with the sanction, I can tell you by looking at the form and then deciding about this and cutting it out, I'm going to come out the same judgment I made later. Otherwise, I'm a fickle of transcendentalists, we call us here, don't we? Did you spell that? I had to go to the Oxford Dictionary to find it out there. I thought it was good. Okay, now we're going to add fields to question. We're going to have a question about this, a question about this, a question about this. You mean this is so clear? <laughs> uh, the card is obviously true. <coughs> question. Like, for example, kick the snobby direct stop and kick us in Moesha. Moesha, the head is not a stop and kick. And the guys coming in to Moesha, the head really is not a punch. Occasionally it works. These are not absolute truths. So occasionally it works. Occasionally they're remotely. It's not a good stat to teach a fighter. And when the fighters get nervous, they always just do a roundhouse. Don't think a guy's possible. The guy does a roundhouse, the guy's not even in. A real good stiff uh, front foot sidekick is not. Even if sparring for us is no good, we can do it over the point. If you kick the guy knocking down, it won't give you a point. Yeah. Another another point for an, an uh, Kumite would be wasted motion. What? Wasted mo a, a wasted action. Yeah, yeah, wasted action. I think, oh, we have that up in the <clears> Where you hit them. Well, all they do is roundhouse to the shot. Well, we'll put that wasted action on here, right? Now, that, that's the same thing. Wasted <clears throat> actions like useless actions. The main actions like you're out of your what to do, see a roundhouse kick, and you keep showing the guy your range. Over and over and over again, then when he moves in, he's trying to kick him. You never let a guy read you like that. You agree, right? No, that's good, huh? Yeah. Bob? Larry? John? Carol? Pat? Okay, well, we accept that, but uh, that pretty much closes it. Okay? Now let's go over here to, the, uh, to page 14. I'll read this again because this is important. And this is one thing. You really have to understand. David Douche is the, uh, uh, is the same as Hawkins. And he's the head of the, uh, for us as the Colton chair at the, uh, at the Oxford. He says, imagination is a straightforward form of virtual reality. What may not be so obvious is that our mind, our direct experience of the world through our senses is a virtual reality too. For our external experience is never direct. No, we do even experience the signals in our nerves directly. We would not know what to make of streams of electrical crackles that they carry. What we experience, and by the way, if you overload the nervous system by snapping the eyes or whacking a person, you really can't make sense of it either. You can't have that. What we experience, and if somebody is doing a technique, like for example, a running person, and you throw them, they're overwhelmed by the sensory thing and they can't make sense of that. You see. Or, and then conversely, the karate, when the judo people are really hit hard, they can't make sense of that either. Because they're not used to being hit hard in the face area. They're used to falling backwards. What we experience directly is at page 6.23. What we experience directly is a virtual reality rendering conveniently generated for us by our subconscious mind from sensory data plus complex inborn and acquired theories about how to interpret them. Uh, I have uh, the old book, the first one is done by, by Sagan, the second one is done a little differently, and then I'll have, uh, because I'll have a chapter, it'll be a chapter of 7.17, and that'll be a chapter like that for all the final number of these pages. Okay, and then the uh, uh, second one says, we realists take the view that reality is out there, objective, physical, and independent, what we believe about it, but we never experience that really directly. Every last scrap of our external experience is a virtual reality. And every last scrap of our knowledge, including our knowledge of the non-physical words of logic, mathematics, and philosophy, and of imagination, fiction, art, and fantasy, is encoded in a form of programs for the rendering of those worlds on our brain's own virtual reality generator. And when you say programs, we're referring to the accumulation of the so-called me. 
These programs can transfer from one brain to the other by mimic reproduction. And functioning over here again, this says uh, we're talking about functional blindness. Instilling your own functional literacy in students is a form of censorship, and grouping of students by perceived ability is a form of discrimination. Now, by perceived ability, it means that you're saying those people that are flexible and not flexible, those people that can fight and cannot fight, you're saying that those people have power and those people that do not have power. That is grouping by ability, by perceived ability. And that is wrong. And as you say, but the teachers rarely reach conclusions that generate ill will with the people that pay. The natural consequence is those people uh, that uh, uh, who control the organizations are those people who can get the most money. The existence of such organizations often depend upon those teachers and the substandards, uh, subsequent uh, standards set can be said to be formed by the student body. Education is at all times a twofold aim, namely instruction and training in good conduct. The concept of good conduct varies with the political institutions and social traditions of community. In the Middle Ages, when there was a hierarchical organization proceeding from the serf by gradual stages up to God, chief virtue was obedience. Children were taught to obey their parents and the reverence of social superiors, to feel awe in the presence of the priest, and submission in the presence of the Lord of a man. And uh, we sometimes do exactly the same thing. When it is sought to produce a certain kind of behavior in a child or animal, there are two different techniques. We may, on the one hand, by means of rewards and punishment, cause a child or animal to perform or abstain from such precise, certain precise acts, but we may, on the other hand, seek to produce in the child or animal such emotions as will lead, on the whole, to the acts of the kind desired. That's real clear. We can punish people and conform to acts, or we can create emotions that cause acts desired. So we can have a punishment or a rising emotions. They're not the character stick. There's two different kinds here. By a suitable distribution of rewards and punishment, it is possible to control a very large part of over behavior. Usually, the only form of reward and punishment required will be praise or blame. By this method, boys who are naturally timid can acquire physical courage, and children who are sensitive to pain can be taught stoical endurance. Good manners, if not imposed earlier, can be learned in adolescent by means of no worse punishment than contemptuous lifting of an eyebrow. What is called good form is acquired by almost all who are exposed to it, merely from the fear of bad opinion occurred by infringing upon it. Those who have been taught from an early age to fear the displeasure of their group as the worst of misfortune will die on the battlefield in a world which they understand nothing rather than suffer the contempt of fools. The English public schools that carry this system of perfection have largely sterilized intelligence by making you cringe before the herd. This is what's called by making a boy manly. As a social force, the behaviorist method of conditioning is therefore very powerful and very successful. It can and does cause men to act in ways quite different from those in which they would otherwise have acted, and is incapable of producing, and is capable of producing an impressive uniformity of overt behavior. Nevertheless, it has its limitations. And this is exactly what I'm talking about as a student getting out there and doing his product for score. The one with the highest score is the highest grade and wins the note. This is exactly what I'm talking about. There are, however, <coughs> some undesirable habits in regard to which the method of rewards and punishment fails completely, even from its own point of view. One of them is bedwetting. 
When this persists beyond the age in which it usually stops, punishment only makes it more obstinate. Though this fact had been known to psychologists, it's still unknown to most schoolmasters. And for years on end, punished boys having this habit, without ever noting that the punishment does not produce reform. The cause of the habit, older boys, is usually some deep-seated, unconscious psychological disturbance. Actions will be different now. But if we brought them to the surface before a cue can be affected. Now, in karate, we have a similar type of thing. You have to bring the habit to the surface. And when it's half the surface, only then can you correct it. As long as you remain deep-seated and unconscious, you have no ability to deal with it. The same kind of uh, psychological mechanism applies in many less obvious instances. In the case of definite nervous disorders, this is now widely recognized. Kleptomania, for example, is not uncommon in children, and unlike ordinary thieving, it cannot be cured by punishment. But we all suffer to a greater or less degree from nervous disorders having an emotional origin. And man is called <coughs> sane when he is as sane as the disorder as the average of his contemporaries. But in the average man, many of his mechanisms which determine his opinions and actions are quite fantastic, so much so that a world of real sanity would be called insane. It is dangerous to produce good social behavior by means which leave the antisocial emotions untouched. That's the wrong with our society. In karate, we bring out these antisocial emotions and we look at them and bring them, and then we handle them. And we're unique in that cat and that cat's back. So long as these emotions, while persisting or denying all outlet, they will grow stronger and stronger, leading to impulses of cruelty, which will at last become irresistible. In the man of weak will, these impulses may break out from crying or some form of behavior to which social penalties are attached. In the man of strong will, they may take an even more undesirable form. He may be a tyrant in the home, ruthless in business, bellicose in public, persecuting in a social minority. For all these qualities, other men with similar defects of character will admire him. He will die universally respected after having spread hatred and misery over city and nation or an epic according to his ability and opportunities. Correct behavior combined with bad emotions is not enough, therefore, to make a man's contribution to happiness in mankind. If this is our criteria of desirable conduct, something more must be sought as an education and character. This is directly and absolutely talking about the uh, about the uh, development of the uh, of the karate instructor and development of the student. And so the idea of punishment, which we have all the time, you're sparring with somebody and the guy goes not defend, you kick him in the ribs, so he lets you bring his hands out. That's punishment, directly and absolutely. See, we're running into the Western character assessment. Eastern character assessment, they don't care if they get you your box. Everybody's the same. Here, where we want the, the, the lofty character to develop, then things just they don't fit at all. Okay, now talking about Wells again, going back from uh, Yale. And uh, I would, uh, this is the last of my, uh, this is the last of my going on here. Oh, the last one. Okay. But, here, but, uh, but these are important issues. See, this is way beyond the taking and punching. How do we induce these things? As you know, in dealing with law enforcement, this is the number one problem in the country today. How do you deal with this mind and sort of stuff, too? There are three methods by which we can induce irrelevance. Irrelevance. We're talking about irrelevant things. First is to adhere to an obsolete verbal value system while adopting new behaviors, such as a traditional Japanese karate in the modern world of competitive sports and television and everything else. By doing that, we can reduce the relevance. Adhere to obsolete behavioral norms while professing new values, which we have here, right? Such as character, stuff like that and devise a compromising conflict between necessary behavior and converted values. All three are maladaptive in their own ways, but the comp compromised uh, conflict condition is by far more common than the two extremes as it disperse, uh, disperses stress over both fields. The first method is the English method of claiming tradition while moving towards resolution of real problems. The 
the history of the House of Lords is an admirable example of a traditional system, retaining its tradition, its tradition of little else where common sense to reality. The second method is that of the phony liberal <coughs> who agrees to change is necessary and never gets around to it. A folks example would be the American who in the 1960s agreed that schools would be half integrated someday. The third method is one of virtuous pragmatism. One that doubts is necessary and makes it appear to be ideal. An example of this process is found in the optimist who tries to convince himself and anyone else who will listen that necessary to write on. This is the best of all worlds possible at this moment in current behaviors of the realization of historic tradition and religious morality. All three methods reduce distance by distorting information, by denying reality or inventing fantasy, because distortion is the mechanism. It sort, of, uh, it sort of strikes me that we have the mechanism of distortion. It really does. And we take a normal thing, and uh, we, we actually uh, say what we want it to mean. And we go ahead and we give these big, long lectures, and we're using the words. Now, I got, I'm going to give you five minutes here, would you please? And in sense, can I read this in five minutes? No, we'll do this later, this thing here. But what I want to do, I really want to go through this idea that, that we're distorting fundamental ideas. You use Japanese words and character, you use these things, and there's distortion of concept. This way, there's no distortion of concept. We're not distorting things. What we really want to do is move and move really according to the circumstance with no fundamental things. The human being, when they try to think, lays down a whole series of barriers to the thought. Self-imposed barriers and self-imposed snags are horrible. Okay? When you learn to walk, you try to get rid of those things, so why put them back? Because you have a stylized opinion on what you want to do. So let's just say we move naturally, freely, and respond to the situation without any, any barriers. The second thing here is the bad thing, is to impose barriers. Tension, here, there's not a thing in here that's not self-imposed. <coughs> so we need to unify this stuff, and how do we unify this stuff? We have to inculcate it. It's like I speak, as I said before, acronyms with an acronym accent. I couldn't teach it to you. I don't know what it is, but if you're with me long enough, you'll pick it up. And that's called inculcation, learning by osmosis. And I think the term word, the modern word, is not inculcation, it's internalization. It's the more where you internalize the values. So you can internalize the values by certain methods. In the old days, the Masonic rituals were an internalization of values. And then it was learning how to say four score or seven years ago was an internalization of values. But we've got away from that where we can't internalize values because the argument has been which values? Okay, which values? In the martial arts, that's very clear for us, isn't it? No, because the guy wants the guy's a champion, karate champion, world champion, kata, kumite, they're not even the same thing. They might as well be two entirely different sports. They're not the same thing, are they? They were. Because remember, the kata was the rules and pattern that were used to transmit information. It was not a competitive sport. Kata was the rules and pattern which you transmit information. Application of the information was called fighting. Now you can fight with ideas, or you can fight with appearances and concepts. Many ways to fight. You can fight financially, you can fight whatever, but you have to. But the, the uh, fighting needs a conflict. And a winning fight needs to resolve the conflict, such as Budo. You cut the guy's head off or you simply win the argument. But resolving the conflict is the important point. And if you walk away feeling mad, nervous, and upset, and you're pissed off about it for a long time, then you've lost because you want. That's the argument of Buddhism, the idea of attachment. So the idea to win the conflict is walk away with the core mind that you did your very best and go on and do something else. But this unification of things is critical. So the patterns were the set of the unification, but they were never designed to be the, the, uh, the struggle itself. The codic is an inculcation mechanism. It is not the struggle itself. The struggle is another area. But the, if you, all you do is struggle, you never set the values in place. And so what I'm saying is that the normal cop does not set the values in place. All it is is a ritualized sport. And on this, I'm sustained by every major karate master that I've known. From Higiana to Kagi and uh, Kemal Mabuni and all these people, they all agree. Everybody agrees. Now, how do we 
be escaped it, though. Because the problems aren't held at the top, they hold at the bottom. And I know why. The guys at the top one time practice karate. The guys at the bottom don't. They associate with the karate master and they call that practice. Now, I was really pleased yesterday that I saw everybody on the floor training. Everybody. No matter what they were, the FBI, the PhDs in this, the doctors in this, the dentists, the, the uh, lawyers, everybody was on it. I don't lawyer, we don't have lawyers, but hopefully we have a <laughs> Everybody was on the floor training. The training, the training, the training. You know, that's unique to our, our operation. We train. But we train under principles. And hopefully we know what those principles are. And the principles are a name, a feat, are meaningless. We strike them through, put them through the purple basket. We don't throw them away, we throw them in the purple basket. And then we go someplace where somebody wants to order something purple, we bring out the purple basket and teach that stuff, right? <coughs> Isn't that true? Don't throw away your garbage, somebody may want to eat it. <laughs> See what you get? <laughs> There's a really stunning viewpoint. As I said before, that's like finding an answer over your strawberry ice cream. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead. <laughs>
what you've done in the middle of other movement. They don't sue a life of their own. Forms are a rest and a reformation for other techniques. Now, you guys, I congratulate you. You have a lot of people here who have one thing wrong or another, and uh, yet you're older people and younger people, which are all out here together on the floor. And I really congratulate you. That's marvelous. That's marvelous. And that's what we were trying to do. After a while, the movement became the end of the game. And you start being fun. Instead of walking with you, you start just moving your hips away from you. So the mind of things start taking care of itself through experience. But to translate this experience into something more exponential is a problem. As we were talking earlier about, about uh, uh, Darwin's theory of evolution, which many people agree with the dog. Uh, but the statement fundamentally is that every species is dependent upon the prior species. Very right from the prior species. And that's all it says. So we can say here for yourself that every action derives from a prior action. And in that sense, as instructors, it's extremely important to be able to link those so that we have some kind of meaning. Otherwise, we the nonsense. But here, the movement is experienced. The movement, the same movement of that type of fighting, translates <coughs> into the form and back into fighting. So the actions are started helping each other have an inner meaning. And that inner meaning of concept, and when it comes interwoven with the social consciousness, becomes a hallmark of crime. That's the whole idea. Now, we can buy this out of trouble, and we will keep lunch and try to return about one or two in the rack. Hey! 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 I will be much more certain that the people are called. This time, I left everything up to the Shion. Everything. I did not notify anybody except by mail, and not many mails, so the Shion are supposed to do it. And if Shion don't do it, then who's to do it? Right? That's the case. So you know I'm saying correct. You know it's right. No more needs to be said. But uh, a diligent way to do it is to have somebody call every black belt and get a, a reason why or why not. And then uh, sign them up in advance and get them, get them wherever we're going to have to be. There are legitimate reasons that people can't be here. And there are there are legitimate cases. And I know that to be true. And I'm not complaining about that. I'm not complaining about the support we do get. But I'm saying that you do not have control of your shina, of your, your sensei. And it, it would be enough. Of, I'm not talking about black belts now. I'm talking about the sensei under the black belts. These guys gleefully, I gleefully, <coughs> Speaking with her. These guys gleefully go ahead and they sit in front of the students at testing times and start giving all kinds of directions about everything. And evidently they know about everything. I've listened to them, I snuck up behind them, I've listened to them give stories or actually counter to what I think. Talk absolutely against what I'm telling somebody. As a matter of fact, I tell a student something and they turn right around and correct them with a great big smile on their face without blinking an eye. So, for historically, now, try to remember this. We have the Gashia, Conroe. The Gashia. Now, this is not, there's different ways to spell this, and the spelling is not necessarily right here. I always have to look it up myself. Uh, but it, it's, uh, I, I, uh, we can do it. It's really, uh, a Higyama, but they put the Gashiyama because this is a word like Shimabuku Shimabukuru. This guy was uh, an old man with a beard. How do you like this? He had a beard that came down like that. Okay? And he uh, is a pretty major guy. And uh, he was studied in, in China and he came back, and this is maybe about the 18th, 19th century. And he had three or four major students, Miyagi was one. Uh, Another student over here was Toyama. Now this guy taught what you call the uh, Wushan and Shaolin. Uh, doing. 
He said, I'm doing the Wushan and, Sha and the Shaolin. This is one is, is, well, the hard, strong, the other is quick, fast, or the hard, soft. And the guy said, oh, you're doing the two kinds of this in victory, so you're doing the Goju. So he assists at that time, assumed his name is Goju. <coughs> of his group, you know the Amaguchi. Uchiyami. Some others. And from this group also comes up Mr. So. For Mr. So, in conjunction with over here, kind of fellow kind Che. And Che is known as Masutatsu Emoyama, Masutatsu Yama, from the Hippie Kyushu guy. Now, this is a Mr. So. Now, on this Mr. Toyama, he had several teachers as they were out in the day. He had, because you remember, you learned the kata from the guy who was a teacher. And one of his major teachers was uh, Aku Atosu. And Atosu had a teacher who was named Mushi Matsumura. Soka Matsumura. Soka Matsumura. Who had a teacher uh, called Tode. That's Chinese and Saka, Saka Gala. Who had a teacher called uh, uh, Kong Cheng Fu. Which is probably a pseudonym for somebody or other. This is for parents of uh, uh, Okinawan Tashe. This fellow here, Matsumura, uh, did the Basai Farms. This guy here did the Guapu guy in favor of his teacher, who was Kushikura Mwakudai. They changed the name. Now, besides that, he had a teacher named Masato. Ako Masato, they both had the same name, as Oto and Tosu had the same name. And Masato was more of a swordsman. He did much more sword work than he did. Uh, uh, the, he was pretty much renowned for the sword work, actually. And these two people, as such, had another student called Funiko Shigechi, whose trade name was the Shotokan. And Funiko had a student after his son, Higo Funiko who died during the war. He had a major student called Yam. Uh, that um, 
he gave it to Toyama and wanted to learn. And so Toyama looked at him, and they looked at his technique. And Toyama said, well, I can't teach you anything. You know everything already, but I'd like to learn what you're doing. Because Toyama was a aficionado of, uh, of, our, uh, of the, uh, the Chinese arts. And he says, OK, I'll teach you what I'm doing. And Toyama said, I'll teach you what I'm doing. So Toyama then promoted him. Uh, at that time, Toyama was, because uh, I understand it, and he disagrees, so don't worry about what he says about this. But I understand Toyama was in the area of the fifth on in that degree. So at that time, he promoted uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Yu to one grade under under his, which was fourth on. Now, from this Toyama, also in the United States, comes Kiwon Kim. From Silver, Silver King, Maryland, who attains uh, either second or third degree under him, and Mitchell Barbara under another degree, Kiwon Kim. But Kiwon Kim was given a job in the Mudukwan, <coughs> and so he accepted a, a position, ninth on Mudukwan. So this is another area, and he's a Silver Spring. And his brother, in was Richard Chung from New York City, was that Joe Hayes and all those guys were connected with. Now, this fellow, in Beyond Yoon, then came to Toyama, and he trained with Toyama, and he taught Toyama. Uh, he, uh, they shared techniques, it's a better expression, with Toyama's Chinese techniques, and he learned the Toyama style, and, and he was promoted to uh, work on under the old, old measurement system, uh, under the old measurement system, not historic, under the old era in 1937. I think it was, I think it was 1934, 1937, 1937, sounds more realistic. I, I don't know about that. And uh, that is what the story is for people to know, and that has to be further researched. Okay, but that's for a thought. Now, in this being working with Toyama, then another fellow was teaching us in Toyama too, and his also name was was uh, uh, what was his last name? Jim Deng Yun, another Bian? Uh Bian is Wei Bian. Yeah, Bian Wei Bian. I mean, there's another Bian down here, and this Bian anyway was the head of the Kwame Khan, and which is the Korean house. It was the same as the Kwame Khan there. Which they later they changed the name to Han Mukhan in Korea. Han Mukhan, which means the same thing. Han Mukhan. And, and, uh, and this is Han Mukhan, the same word, and it changed to the Ren Mukai. And the Ron Marchini and Hayashi Yuri Ren Mukai. This went over and was picked up. Finally, by a guy named Yoon. And this Yoon that picked it up got his fourth degree at the same time Mr. Parker found the Jita Kwan. And when the Jita Kwan was founded at that time, it came under, again, a transfer of Mabuni. We have a story. Kind of really complicated matrix. But Toyama up here. He did, uh, both of these guys, both Yuns, uh, both Yuns, went back to Korea. One being in the Jita Kwan, and the other founding the, uh, what they call Chango Kwan. <coughs> Chango Kwan. The Genji Grove founded the Songo Kwan, which is the same as the Queen of Shotokan. And this Chango Kwan, that was the first major gem, was the YMCA. Now, in Bien Yung, you see, this uh, Yung, he was a Korean guy. And he had the title of the Chinese trained Chuan Fai. And he said, in his whole lifetime, the only thing he ever taught was Kwan Bai. That's Kwan Bai, actually, the way you pronounce that. And it's the same term, the term for the old era term, the historic term. Uh, this is going back, uh, back to 1080, the historic term for, uh, for Akara or for Trumpa, which is exactly the same word. Trumpa. And see, Tai Chi is Trumpa. Okay? This is where this goes back. So this Indian Yun himself, 
is the important guy that leads it. Now, Ibn Yagyun fathered the Chamophon, and he fathered it as a Shihan of the of Toyama Shudokan. He was a Shihan in Korea of, uh, of a Shudokan legitimate to YMCA. And that's verifiable. We verified it. Is that correct? It's in uh, Toyama's book. Yes, yeah, in Toyama's book. Now, Ibn Yagyun, over here, this Chamophon, had three students of note. One was Namsukli, and the other is Chilly Park. Whose son, by the way, is, a, is in the United States, and he's a major representative of snowboarding. And he's a real big monkey monkey of snowboarding. And uh, uh, you see him on the Olympics. If you see him, there's name is Raven Park. He does all that stuff, and he's one of the really heavy snowboarders. And third is Mr. Hong. I have a seventh dog from Mr. Hong. I have uh, a tenth dog from over here. And I have a seventh dog from Mr. Mr. Hong. And I have uh, actually a uh, fourth dog from here. But I have a, a tenth dog. Uh, I have a ninth dog from here, a seventh dog from him, a ninth dog from here. And the reason I only have a seventh dog here is because I never met him. And he's giving me a courtesy grade. Because he's the one, Mr. Park, we used to always do the same exercise. They all do the relationship every day, every time they eat, they do those relationships. All the time, every time. Now, not simply when Mr. Mr. Uh, Indian disappeared after the Second World War, not simply took over the gym. And Kelly Park was junior to him, and Mr. Park achieved his fourth degree in 1951. And he was the uh, fourth on, and he was junior to him, but he continued practicing, and he did not. And so Mr. Chumley Park arrived in a senior position. Mr. Park was a major in the military institute, and everybody that came through, including Jury and Henry Chow, were white belts in his class. Now, Mr. Hong is an old, old man. He's a senior. He's still there in Korea. These guys are still in Korea. Now, from Mr. Park, there's some noble people. One is the Chosen Doe, and this is by, by uh, Kim Su, he calls himself, but his name is Kim Pyong <whistles> Su. And Kim Pyong Su was Ilju Kim's teacher for years and years. And when they first got the, uh, uh, the Taekwondo, they named it Taishu Do. We were originally Taishu Do. <coughs> Taishu Do's origin was when Mr. Mr. Uh, 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 Kim got the first patch for the Taekwondo. We heard it was Taekwondo. We decided to use the word Taekwondo. We had to send the patch to Korea, the Kim Pyong Soo, before uh, we were allowed to wear the patch. And before any students were issued here, Kim Pyong Soo came to Akron from Vietnam and uh, approved for the patches. So I've known this guy since Moon, for Moons. He's very, very good. He's on the web. And he's a very close group, but he's excellent. The other person that's very important from this same group and Mr. Park is uh, a Con Reed. And is he and sir, at the same time or before or after? Uh, uh, this is uh, about this, this is uh, see, he just started as a child. He was really he was a real child, so actually he's senior, but he's junior in age, so this guy. Con Reed now he's older. is the one where that the Bill Wallace trained with in Memphis. He's the one that gave up. Uh, that uh, gave Wallace his first black belt. He's the one who gave Elvis Presley his black belt. So you go out to Elvis Presley's place and you see the certificates from Connery, the uniforms work out from Connery, so everything about Connery. Later on, when they got into movies, then that Parker came in, but actually his teacher for Bill Wallace was Connery. Now the other student that we know of know is Chung Wa, or Wa Chung, you could call it. And this is, they just say Chung, his last name is Chung, but uh, Chung Wa. And Chun Hua is the president of the United States Taekwondo Association, the Olympic organization. And I want more that I should know, besides the two presidents of Korea that were just recently released, uh, uh, the Mr. Uh, Mr. Ro and Mr. Chen Da Wan, the president just out of jail, and new one going in, there's a Mr. Lee. Who was surprisingly enough, and I was on the uh, flag with the Olympic Committee from a pack of local in Mexico City, had dinner with the President of Mexico, and I was sitting beside Mr. Lee. And he said, uh, I said, What are you doing? He said, I'm General Secretary of the, 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 the Taekwondo Federation. 
That's Vaughn, George Anderson. I said, you guys pass that one up to us. I have a t-shirt for you. He says, who's that? I said, Mr. Uh, Johnny Park. He says, you know him? He said, yeah, I know him. And I said, yeah, I do a conga one. I said, he says, uh, you're conga one? I said, yes, I'm not that conga one. He says, oh, never heard any more from it. But then he saw Mr. Park, and he told Mr. Park, and he talked about action. Uh, Mr. Park is the chairman of the board, and head of the board of directors and the, and the founder of the Congo Line, but actually the president of the Congo Line is Mr. Lee. So he, he, he didn't know what I was saying, so he real quick went back and checked his files to make sure I wasn't lying about it, see? And then he was very friendly with me afterwards. <laughs> that is so funny because we were up in this gathering, this guy constructed into the fourth and fifth Don Chung run, walking on very gleefully, thinking how important he was. And and then I, I had to go over to see John, explain John was a senior in the and also Also, he, he, he and I got stuck in with a needle and he deflated immediately. But anyway, Mr. Lee is the general secretary of the WTF. Now, from this mess comes, <coughs> comes this connection, and the Chuan Fa comes the, uh, uh, the Walong Tai Chi and Hong Kong Greg. These two are connected to Mr. Masafumi Suzuki and also connected to Mr. Uh, Mr. Namsuk Lee, like this. And so we're connected here. These are two connected from here. And this is handled through really Jim DeSalt, but they're still connected to these two links. Okay. And there's another link I was going to. Uh, so Yoyama over here, Yoyama then is the first cousin of this group, and Mr. So is like, is like Mr. Uh, if you would go, Mr. Chubby Park's uncle. Now there's another connection in here besides that. What is it? Uh, yeah, I can't think for a minute. Something slipped my mind here. Uh, you, you getting all this? What? <laughs> 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 This Tron so we rightfully do the Tron we're right in line with the Tron Oh, yes, and then from this, these guys are the foremost experts of what they call uh, not Cooksol, well, they are with the Cooksol one, uh, or with the Keto Federation, which it directly calls it, but we have a Robukai, uh, <coughs> Robukai, uh, Yamazaki, which is a harangue of Korea. With, uh, which is connected again. The Harang of Korea and Roman are exactly the same thing, and they're connected to Mr. Kim Jong Un. And they're part of the, uh, the Keto Federation of all things. So Kanishi is part of the, it was part of the Harang, part of the Zul Greek, because the Harang is an ancient name for this group. And Kanishi was the charge, connection with, uh, was connected again to these people over here, right in here. So Kanishi was connected to. Where's Kanishi? Where's Kanishi? He's not up there. Kanishi was Grandmaster Trios, a supposed sponsor, but he wasn't. He was a friend and signed on to a lot of things, but he was not. So Kanishi was sort of like over here. But uh, now I, was, I, I just remembered what I wanted to say and I forgot it. Just that fast. A fickle brain, you know? But anyway, uh, uh, oh, Takagi. Who's the hero Takagi? was from Mr. Funakoshi over here, but he got mad at Nakayama, so he split off, and he found the rigor. They were still with the Shotokan, he's a big knife on Shotokan. But in this connection with the Shotokan, he connected back with these two guys, Otto and Tosso, and down here at Toyama. So he was quasi-connected to Toyama. And because he was connected to Toyama, he became a very good personal friend of Mr. Chali Park. You see, and they stayed together in Korea, so Toyama's a part of that. Now, the other guy that enters is, is, is like, it's Saka, the head of the Shorinji Ru Kempo. And the Shorinji Ru Kempo is up here, Shorinji Ru Kempo, and he was here, Ru Kempo, is connected to uh, this group over here, back this way, and back this way, and back over here, unbelievably. <laughs> now, all these guys live with a real short spirit. See, and there's a, there's a really kind of connection. So this is our history. This is your history. Everybody's connected to everybody. It's about it. No accident that I became uh, the head of the, uh, of the uh, Sebu Khan, 
uh, from Oka, uh, from Japan. There's no acid on the head of the central taekwondo, which is now a sub quan of the chung quan. I have ninth thumb with both uh, uh, with both of these uh, major guys that nobody has. I have a tenth thumb here, ninth thumb here, eighth thumb here. From all that are interconnected, because all the young people say, yeah, I approve. Okay, let's issue this guy great. And he said, what does he do? Well, he does what we do. Okay, fine. And this is the way the thing works. Now, these guys are about ready to die. And if you want those grades, you can get them. But they're not going to pay you to take them. And they take their tons of money. They take your money from you for the grades. If you want the grades, you can have them. If you don't want them, you can't. If you want to advance this way, and the wall of them, and, and this is difficult now because this has been confiscated by mainland China, by the Chinese government, under Chinese hand. The wall of Tai Chi from Canton and the Hong Kong Dragon are just really under there and they control the grading. There's still some available, but it's difficult and, and it doesn't handle as easily as it was. Just like originally, Mr. Park couldn't get uh, things out of Korea. They wouldn't let the Koreans issue grades from Korea to the United States. Now, certainly, these, uh, you can still get grades from these, and these are really important people. You get grades from there. Uh, you have to pay for them, you can get them. They're available, but uh, they won't be available, and they will be done. And uh, that's the end of it. When the matter is closed, it's closed. You can do that. So depending upon how much money you got, what you want to do, you can structure your plan on this kind of thing. And most of the sensei here, the Shihan here, can take some kind of grading plans. Uh, like, you know, who's who came charge a thousand bucks for a black belt these days? And actually, that sounds like a lot of money, but remember, 20 years ago, that was 100 bucks. And money exploded that way. Just like, I mean, I would never think I'd pay two or three dollars for McDonald's hamburger. I was thinking more like a quarter, you know, five bucks for a pair of jeans. So, anyway, these grades are available. And they're really bona fide, but this is how the thing links. So the Goju Ru, you see, by nature, is like a, you go back up the line, it's from Park to Yun, the to Toyama, the Higashiyama. Just like that. That's not very far. Could you say that again, sir? Yes. You go from Park, right, to Indian Yun, the to Toyama, the Higashiyama. These two are first cousins. These two are second cousins. These two are third cousins. Well, actually, that's not true. That's not true. I'll uh, redo it again. First cousin. First cousin once removed. First cousin, uh, uh, yeah, first cousin. First cousin once removed. First cousin twice removed. Mr. Park is the first cousin of Miyagi twice removed. Now, this guy here, Mr. So, is a student, is a, is a set up. Uh, first cousins, I was second cousins. Uh, no, this is uh, yeah, second, second cousins, and second cousins once removed. So the, the Joshin guy are second cousin for us once removed by the charts. Now, furthermore, <coughs> there's another guy here called Joshin Chiban. Now, Aku Toso was also a Ted. These two guys are also a teacher of Funakoshi. So Toyama and Funakoshi were first cousins. So as Toyama is the key to the whole central issue here, as you see. It's actually the key to everything. So Chosen Shibata, what was he? Matsubashi Shoranru. He's the big Shoranru guy. But it's not a problem because Shoran, you understand, is Shaolin, or Shorin, <coughs> Shorin, or this here. I think I spelled right, Shorin style. Now, obviously, I know this. Uh, the person you just brought up there, can you spell that name for me, sir? Who? The one you just talked about being from the Shorin room? Shorin. 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 I was the head of the Google Referee Council. 
because of my positions, and I was head of world technical committees, and I did hold the highest grades in the school for Mr. Park. I held the highest grades for Mr. In, in, among Americans for him. They've known me since ever the beginning, since way the beginning. Actually, he got his uh, second don for Mr. Uh, Benchick wrote directly, then he handed it to you. I was there when he handed you your second degree. You tested for your second degree under him, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, under Benchick wrote. Directly under the guy. And uh, so this is a, a, is a network that we really have a real close relationship to all this stuff. And so we can talk directly for them, and our values are, are similar to this. So when we talk about core values, we're talking about the same as the go-to rule and all this stuff. We know these guys. The guys know me, too. And this is what I've done. I put this together with these relationships, and I've resented the face well. So all these people trust me to take care of their job, just like I trust my she hands to take care of the job. Bring your students. Because many of you know I could go home and die, and you never hear this story again. And like uh, Ellis is an Ellis, aren't you, Jeff? Sir. <laughs> but how do you know? Five generations back, there was 64 Ellis. What's the other 64 three pieces? You like to peel on an apple, you call yourself an apple. Right, sir. <clears throat> See, so you need to know that other thing. So we have our little apple peel, and this is the this is the apple right here. The whole thing. So where we come from, this is who we are, this is who you are, and where your style comes from, your techniques. Now, the fact is, do I know what I'm talking about when I'm teaching techniques? Am I really teaching it? Yes, sir, and these guys come and watch me. They come and sit on top of me and look at the technique. You see? And the last time Mr. Park came here, he said, that was the greatest instructor you've ever seen. That was a genius. That like, and actually, he said directly, he says, you're like Beethoven. He says, you're the greatest, uh, the greatest. And I thought to tell me more. I really liked that, but of course he said so for all the students. And when Mr. Parker, wow, I can't tell us just about four foot in the air. He took up like a bird, and he went straight up in the air. Remember? Because <laughs> he always liked to fight, see? He was a fighter. His technique is superb, and really hard to get along with. And he does like money. Like he comes to the United States, and he can't get money out, and he says, okay, you take care of my tank. I never paid him for anything, and he gave me everything I ever wanted before he ever gave me. But he asked me for $5,000, I sent it to him. And where do I get the $5,000? I got a gigantic vacuum cleaner. Oh, you guys, <laughs> oh, you guys, I get the money. <laughs> that's where it comes from. So I need to help on that stuff sometimes. And that's the reason for the uh, for the, uh, the big structure we have, and the things is we have a, that, you know, it used to be you couldn't hire me. I had a roofing company, and I was running around taking care of things, but now I work for you. That's what I do. I really work for you. You couldn't have this. So I need to be well taken care of. I need to continue to do the work. And I need the tools because Mr. So, this old man, who is the head of the Kyoshi Guy today, Oriana's organization, they considered the best Goju man of living, ninth degree, wanted to come to the United States. It cost me 10 grand. I could have brought him here last year. I did not because I didn't have the money. Okay? The greatest living Goju man, the senior student of Miyagi Sensei, the direct grandson of Higashiyona could have been here, sitting and talking. He could have been up here. You could have talked to him and asked him questions about whatever you want to. And his nephew would have brought him, Charlie Park, his nephew would have brought him here. So when I went to Japan, and I, I had went to uh, and uh, they gave him eulogy at Suzuki's funeral, the 10th Don, who was the head of Bob Trios' group, and he said, everybody follow George Anderson. I reached into my pocket, and I took a bump money. And with the things, we took a patty and a rich label, and I paid the bills, and they went there and they sat and they listened to him say it. So I had one hostile person, one of my very, very closest people, one hostile person heard him say it. So they were there and they saw the structure of it. Otherwise, if I had said it, who would know whether it would be true or not? So that little trip cost me 8,000 bucks. <clears throat> so that's where your money goes. And when you start seeing this, you say, boy, what a thing we got. Nobody else has this. And, uh, you know, it's a surf talk like that's all. And anyway, we've done really well. Our success is phenomenal. And we have a good thing, and everybody, they manage to do it, and we are. And we don't want to do any drastic things to disturb our ability. But all these people know us, 
And this is a, this is exactly the chart. <coughs> Right? And so is that why we practice karate instead of taekwondo? Is 
Now, wait a minute now. I said Taekwondo is a big term defining Korean karate. Taekwondo, Chang Kwan. Taekwondo is identical. Okay, let me go back here. <coughs> no, that's all right. So there's, there's a question. We're going to do a lot of work here, so I have things I want to do this afternoon. We'll go back. I've got another question for you in a minute. Okay, anyway, maybe I left it out of here. Uh, but uh, I don't see it in there. I have it in here someplace else. But he says, oh, I know. I said it back here, and I put it back in another part of the book. But Henry Cho said, and he's one of the major Taekwondo people, he said Taekwondo is identical to Japanese karate. Identical. Okay, now, Japanese karate has two aspects. Taekwondo and karate have two aspects. There's the old karate, the old Taekwondo, and there's the, the sport Taekwondo and sport karate. Sport Taekwondo and sport karate differ. The old Taekwondo and old, old karate are the same. I get it. Because remember, the Congo one fundamentally is the arm of the Japanese Shukukai. Fundamentally. And the Songo one is fundamentally the same as the Shukukai. So they're really, the karate uh, wasn't resident in Japan for a very long period of time. So you had really Toyama was really not strong Japanese, it really in Okinawa, actually. And so you have this, you have this Okinawa being a different place. And Okinawa is real close to, to China. And you can go from Japan to, uh, uh, to probably China with a robo. It's about 60 miles across from uh, Fukuoka to Kushu Islands. It's very, very close. Very close. Very rough sea. It's rough sea, that's really, because like English right. Channel. Sort of like English Channel that way. Yes? Uh, if you were to explain to why we do patterns, forms, uh, we don't do the WTF forms, how would you? Well, the WTF forms uh, were just made up. They made them up to the right second. They're unreasonable. Everybody says jewelry forms, everybody unreasonable. Unreasonable forms. And so people prefer the old forms. Now, the old forms of Chen Quan, and like that, were corrupted. They, they took the Chen Quan to a piece of it, made the Techni forms, the Chogi forms, made the Kong Kong Moon from that. The Kong Kong Moon, you know, used to be originally the 40 hands, but what could be? That was the way the form you go. One, two, three, boom. That was the way the form started. It was never this way. So it was always flowing. If you watch Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, what is his name? Uh, in Sasoda, we started out the form. It's like our form, you know? The form starts that way. You saw him do it. He didn't recognize Coach Group, but he did it. He did it for you. You would try that and didn't recognize it. You see? So the, 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 there's a real change in the action of these things. The forms used to be flowing and smooth, and then they go like this, the guy down. Now it's, it really changes action. Isn't that right, Bob? I, it, the, old, the forms are just so much different. They're not even all close to like. But Yom Kong Shin, Yom Kong Shin Goon is beautiful form. But it's a small part, it's too short. And it has too much interruptive actions. For example, it has that sidekick that, that, that actually ruins the form forever. The, the, the trepidation over doing the sidekick wipes you out, you know? It has things in there that aren't really supposed to, that aren't good for you. Of course, I've never written that way yet. What are your thoughts on General Che Young's? They're bad. <laughs> I, 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 I like three of them. I like the, uh, I like the Chun Chi to some degree, because that's nothing but a Kwan I like the Chun Chi, and I do like Chun Wu. And Wan Hill, I thought were pretty I like the Chun Wu real well. But the old, uh, uh, there's, uh, the Chengmu was good. We did the Chengmu and I still like it for him. How rang? How rang is, that's number six. It's eight. sort of uh, number six, isn't it? Eight. Number eight, yes. Yeah, it's it's uh, sort of, uh, it's not bad for him. It's okay. But I, I learned those directly from General Che. And when I learned them, he was sort of making them up on the spot. And Henry Cho and all the people at Big Dinner at Henry Cho's house, and they're all talking, I couldn't stand for him because they said the forms were different languages. They weren't the same context. The forms all were in context, and I believe that to be true. Chung Wu, of course, is a takeoff from earlier, uh, Chung Wu, General Chung Wu, who was a, a, a Korean general. They had done a form for him a long time ago. Yes, sir. I have a question back here. Uh, didn't, uh, is, would you consider Kim Su, the founder of China, you, uh, uh, one of the uh, students of Chung Park? Yes. Uh, he considered one of the senior students, but remember, when you talk about senior students, he was a lot of people dispute the seniority because his senior uh, his student uh, being senior comes to the fact that he started being six years old or something like that. 
So see, a lot of these other guys started when they're much older, but so they got a senior. So I passed and started maybe two years after, uh, later than the guy that started when he was five years old. I was still a <coughs> past senior even though he started later. Is that kind of thing? Uh, Charm Rui is a member of the JPF. He's a real good personal friend of McCombie's. He's a superb crowd He's absolutely excellent. I don't agree with him on everything, but he's absolutely excellent. He's absolutely excellent. You said you've got to, haven't you, Mac? Yes, yes. That's not a big season. What? Mac, yeah, it's easy, sir. Yes, you may. Yeah, I know your cop's got to go. There's a, there's a police thing. Yeah, I just, this is what Yes, I'll explain. Yes. Now, in the form of the reverse points, the last reverse point. Yeah, that because uh, uh, General uh, General Chang Yu died before he could move loyalty to the Emperor, and therefore he ends up with a left hand punch. The right hand punch uh, was, could not be placed because he died too soon. That's a philosophical uh, judgment on the part. Yes. You know what I mean? We're talking about the Korean form of Chang Yu, which I don't know you guys know or not. This is. <coughs> yes? I had a guy come in here last week, even. Brothers of Black Belt, Kobe Shinkai. Yeah. Came in and watched classes and asked me if that was his dog. Is that what? Came in and watched classes and that's his stuff. Yeah, because we do a lot of things like Kyoshi Kai. See, and, Kyoshi, and he's he putting off for Kyoshi Kai. What? What he saw was the farm you. Yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're so close because so we're bound in. That's why immediately, when, no matter what I saw, I called one. I says, you know, I says, well, how do you know so lucky? He says, look, I said, oh, man. I says, uh, I says what? I said, what do you do? Creedence Phallus? He said, no, no, no. I'm with the, uh, sh uh, with the uh, Shuri room. After a bunch of names, what's the Shuri room? I have bonded with Toyama. He said, my God, you're a custom builder. I can recognize your style. I agree. And he, and he says, well. Then he started talking to this car with a wonder for your voice. And anyway, he was like, uh, he was uh, Then he started talking to me. And before long, he said, boy, he never had any trouble at all because we're the same. So he asked to join the Comic-Con. And I uh, uh, normally say no, but he's a cousin. He's a cousin. So I mean, that makes another situation. So he's a cousin. So, I mean, uh, from the same place. So, you know, cousins are always welcome. As long as they're really cousins. <laughs> <laughs> you might say he's a cousin cousin, but... <laughs> so that's it. Okay, you understand the points here, huh? There's no more questions needed on this. So let's take a 30-second break. We'll start again on this, and we'll go on the testing methods we're right on the floor. Before we do anything else, we're going to head to the floor. And we're going to repeat ten times long before. Come on, check long before. It's a check long before. Uh, oh, fourth one. It's not hard. You don't have to worry about disturbing your neck. <coughs> the fourth one we're going to do over and over and over.